So as you remember, the first semester, we studied bonding and molecular structure. And then toward the end, we did some sort of thermodynamics, which is what connects structure to energy, which is what determines what chemistry will happen. So this semester, we're going to talk about that chemistry, about reaction mechanisms, and about using these reactions to do synthesis. And we'll also do some spectroscopy around the middle of the semester. So just a brief uh, uh, excursion through what we're going to be doing. The first uh, two quarters of the semester are going to be on how mechanisms are discovered and understood in terms of structure and energy, what we talked about last time. So first we'll look, naturally enough, at the simplest reactions. There can't be anything much simpler than just cleaving a bond. But remember, there's also the possibility of making a bond at the same time you break a bond. And we introduced these ideas last semester, of course. So we're going to start with free radical substitution, one of the earlier reactions to be studied, as you remember, in the 1830s in France. Uh, but we're going to talk about, use it to talk about the concepts of reactivity and selectivity. When you can get different products, how do you control or predict which ones you'll get? Uh, then, uh, the nice thing about free radicals is they're not charged. So they're relatively insensitive to solvent. So you can just think about the molecules themselves reacting, and whether it's in the gas phase or solution, more or less the same thing. But it's quite different when ions are involved, either as starting materials or products or both. Because then solvent effects are very important. So as we go from free radicals, we're then going to do solvent effects. Uh, and then go on to nucleophilic substitution reactions, which almost always involve ions either as starting materials or products or both. And you're going to use that as an example of showing how people go around about proving a mechanism. Okay? Then we'll have the first exam on February 2nd. Then we'll go on to electrophilic addition reactions to alkenes and alkynes. You'll recognize that things, these are concepts we introduced last semester, but this time, we're going to focus on how you know about how they work. Uh, and we're going to talk there especially about the role of nucleophiles. You usually call these additions electrophilic, but there's quite often a very important nucleophilic concept uh, uh, component as well. Then we'll get on to polymers and their properties for just a lecture or two. And then conjugation, aromaticity, and pericyclic reactions, which you'll know what they are when we get to them. Then we'll have the second exam. And then we'll have an interlude about spectroscopy and go on to uh, more focus on synthesis. So first, spectroscopy for structure and also for studying dynamics of molecules and reactions. So ultraviolet visible spectroscopy, electronic uh, IR spectroscopy, vibration, which we've talked about a good deal already, uh, magnetic resonance imaging and nuclear magnetic resonance. Then on to aromatic substitution. And finally, carbonyl chemistry and the concepts of oxidation and reduction. Then we'll have the third hour exam. And the last quarter of the course then will be more having to do with carbonyl chemistry, acid derivatives, substitution taking place at carbonyl group, uh, reactivity adjacent to the carbonyl group, the classical condensation reactions. Then something about carbohydrates and Fisher's classical proof of which isomer is which of glucose. And finally, we'll talk about some complex synthesis. We'll be talking about synthetic ideas all through this, but uh, of both unnatural and natural products. Then we'll have the final. So that's how long you have to endure. OK, so at the end of last semester, we were talking about energy and how it related to things. That free energy determines what can happen at equilibrium. And remember, it was all statistics. And the statistics filtered down to give us this handy relationship at room temperature that an equilibrium constant is 10 to the minus 3 fourths of the difference in free energy. Or if you're not worried about entropy, the, the uh, difference in enthalpy in the heat of the molecules. Uh, so that's both energy and entropy, the Gibbs free energy. Uh, but there's a completely independent question, which is will it happen? You know, graphite is more stable than diamond as a form of carbon. But the advertisers tell us that a diamond is forever. Just because it's not as stable doesn't mean it'll convert in any reasonable time. 
So the, question, so the questions of kinetics are just as important as the questions of equilibrium, or at least almost as important. Uh, <clears throat> And we saw last time that you could approach this by studying lots of trajectory, trying to trajectories, trying to calculate how all the atoms move and going from one arrangement to another one. But that really provides too much detail. In fact, over the last couple of weeks, we've had interviews from people who are applying for a faculty position here. And a number of them are talking about fancy new ways of actually looking at one molecule at a time as it reacts, all right? So that you actually could do something getting closer to trajectories. But really, that's more detail than we want. Uh, we want to summarize things statistically to know what's going to happen in a flask. So we have collective concepts, enthalpy and entropy. And then we can have a, a reaction coordinate diagram. Remember, we rolled a marble on that thing last time, on that potential energy surface. Or we could slice along the potential energy surface and looked at the starting material, the transition, state and the products, or uh, we could uh, simplify things to notice that this is just a, a sequence of three species. The starting material, which is molecules that we know about, the, the transition state, which we don't know about, and the products, which we know about. So our challenge is going to be to try to figure out something about the transition state given what we know about the starting material and the products, because its energy relative to those others is going to determine rates. Uh, so we have a, then free energies with just these three species rather than trying to look at a detailed trajectory. Okay, now, so free energy determines what can happen at equilibrium but also how fast it happens in kinetics. And for that purpose, we need to know that how much, what the energy is, either the free energy or the heat at least, of the transition state. Okay, and remember we talked about this last time that in the uh, Eyring's uh, transition state theory, the rate constant for the reaction per second is 10 to the 13th times that sort of equilibrium constant between the starting material and the transition state. So again, we can use at room temperature that 3 fourths delta G when we express it in kilocalories per mole. So we want to use energies to predict equilibria and also to predict rates, first for the very simplest one-step reactions. And no reaction is conceptually simpler than just breaking a bond in the gas phase to give atoms or free radicals. So we need to know the energy for that. Now, uh, in the textbooks that I've handed out to you, there are tables like this one that give bond dissociation energies. How much energy does it actually take to break a bond? Uh, this particular one is from a text we used to use in the course called Streitweiser and Hethcock. Uh, that was in 1993. But as of 2003, there's a new set. And you can see that these don't change very much in time. Uh, 98 became 99, 111 became 113. Some of them are a little bigger, 81 became 85 and so on. And these values I refer to as Ellison's. I mentioned him last semester. There's Barney Ellison. Uh, he and his friends uh, compiled these new values. And he's gonna come and talk to you about how he did this in April sometime. He can't get out of uh, Boulder now. He's all snowed in out there, Colorado. Okay, so this is his, his table of uh, molecular bond dissociation energies for losing H from something. RH becomes R plus H atom, R radical plus H atom. So these are experimental bond enthalpies. And as you can see, some of them are known to very high precision, like H2 is known to uh, six significant figures, right? Most of them, of course, aren't known that well, but most of the ones in this table are known pretty darn well, plenty accurately enough for our purposes. Okay, let's see if we can understand some of these so that we don't have to memorize the table. Uh, let's look at the bonds from H to halogen. You'll notice as we go down to uh, larger halogens from fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, we go from 136 to 103 to 87 to 71. Quite a difference in, in the energy involved. So the idea is that larger halogens don't overlap as well with the hydrogen, so they don't make as strong a bond at their normal bond distances. And there's less electron transfer 
uh, to the halogen. So whereas HF looks like that and the two electrons are lowered quite a bit, in HI, the net amount of lowering of the electrons in forming the bond isn't nearly as much. So that makes sense to us. Okay, so less electron stabilization means a weaker bond. Now, here's the table two, which is uh, bond enthalpies for various atoms or groups attached to various carbon, uh, hydrocarbon radicals. Okay, so let's just look at the, uh, here we have the, it, previously we looked at, at uh, H attached to halogen. Now we're looking at methyl attached to halogen. And you see there's a very similar trend. It's strongest for fluorine, weaker for chlorine, weaker still for bromine, bromine and weakest for iodine. Okay? So many of the same features. But let's try to understand different radicals. So we're going to look at the bonding of H to methyl, ethyl, isopropyl, and t-butyl. And the first thing you notice about this is that they're all almost the same, right? Here, in the in, as we went down the halogens, it varied by, uh, by 60 kilocalories per mole. But as we go across these different methyl ethyl isopropyl t-butyls, they're all 100 kilocalories per mole, plus or minus 5. Okay? So now we're going to look next lecture at this in some more detail and see if we can understand why they vary at all. But they don't vary very much. On the other hand, some hydrocarbon radicals have substantially different ones, like vinyl and allyl, phenyl and benzyl. The vinyl and phenyl are much stronger, 10 kilocalories stronger. The benzyl and allyl are uh, about 10 kilocalories weaker, right? So let's see if, based on what we, uh, uh, we did last semester, we can understand why this might be so. Uh, are these unusual bond dissociation energies to be explained as unusual bonds, that is, the bonds are unusually strong or weak? Or is it the radicals are unusually strong or weak? This is compared to what, right? We have the starting material and go to the products where the bond is broken. We go uphill in energy by these amounts, okay? The question is, are things unusual because the starting bond is not as weak or unusually strong, right? Or is it because the radical is unusually stable or unusually unstable, right? Compared to what? So let's look at, at a couple of these cases and see if we can understand. Uh, first, let's look at vinyl, which is the uh, a H attached to a carbon that's double bonded. Now, if we look at the radical, we see that we have a SOMO, so there's the possibility for interacting with something and changing its energy. But notice that the HOMOs and LUMOs that it might interact with are pi and pi star. And there's no special stabilization because they're perpendicular to one another. They're orthogonal. There's no overlap. So there's no reason that having this double bond should make that radical unusually stable, right? Even though, uh, and notice that it's not, that, that it in fact is, is hard to break as if this were unstable, but it's neither stable nor unstable. It's just what it is, okay? On the other hand, if we look at the starting material where we have this CH bond, notice that as compared to these others, which are 100 plus or minus 5, that this one is made from an SP squared carbon, right? So very good overlap. So in this case, it's that the bond is unusual. The bond is unusually strong. The radical is nothing special. It's very hard to break, okay? Now, if we, so it's hard, it's 111, okay? The same thing is true in the phenyl radical, where again, the, the CH bond we're talking about is attached to a double bonded carbon, right? Here it's part of a benzene ring. But again, the unusual energy orbitals in the ring are perpendicular, they don't overlap with the singly occupied orbital we're talking about, right? Therefore, nothing special here. But again, it's an sp squared carbon to hydrogen bond. And again, it's unusually strong, 113 kilocalories per mole. So these are unusual because the starting material has an unusually strong bond. Okay? Now let's look at these others, allyl and benzyl, where it's an unusually easy bond to break. Okay? Now we look at the allyl radical, where we've broken H off this carbon. And now what's different about that? as compared to the ones above. 
we broke the H off, we got a P orbital that has the, uh, the singly, uh, single occupancy. Anybody got an idea about whether it's going to be usual or unusual? Yeah, Sebastian? Pardon me? Uh, now it can mix with a pi star because it's going in and out of the, of the plane, right? So now it overlaps with the pi and pi star. Now what's that going to do? Well, here's the singly occupied orbital, the red one here. Here's pi star, vacant. They'll mix. That would suggest that the single electron would go down in energy, right? That would be good. However, we should also think about the fact that there's an unusually high HOMO associated with the blue orbitals there, the pi orbital. So we could consider instead the pi. And now we see that that would shift this electron up. But these two electrons would go down. Again, you would win more down than up, right? Now, th so this is a little schizophrenic on the part of the singly occupied orbital. Does it move up or down? The answer is no, right? One of them pushes it down, the other pushes it up, stays the same place it started, right? But the others go up and down, right? The ones that came from the pi and the pi star. So you get net stabilization doing, due to this pair of electrons going down. So we have this special allylic, it's called, stabilization from mixing the SOMO with, that pot, with the pi and pi star orbitals adjacent to one another. So this radical is unusually stable. On the other hand, in the starting material, the bond was just a regular old sp3ch bond, nothing special there. Okay? So as compared to here, where the starting material was unusual, unusually strong, here the product is unusually stable. Right? And the same thing is true. So that one's easy to break, 89 kilocalories per mole. And the same is true for the benzyl radical, where the p orbital on the adjacent carbon, again, can overlap with the pi system of the benzene ring. So you get special stability, and it only takes 90 kilocalories per mole. OK, so that we can understand these uh, special cases of uh, bond strengths, of uh, bond enthalpies. Okay. Now, we uh, spoke last semester about the halogenation of alkanes. So you're at e we can use these bond dissociation energies to do some calculations about the possibility of doing halogenation of alkanes. So let's just take as an example methane, some various dihalogen uh, molecules, and we can trade partners, a double displacement sort of reaction, as they called it in the early days and make methyl X and HX, right? So we break the red bonds and form the green bonds. So we have a, a cost to pay in breaking bonds. We had a return from making the bonds, and we're gonna see whether we get a net profit from trying to run this operation. Okay, so we're gonna do it for fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Now, of course, in all those cases, the CH bond is the same. It's 105 kilocalories per mole, okay? Now, but the halogen-halogen bonds are different, right? It's uh, strongest for, it's fairly weak for fluorine, strong for chlorine, but then weaker again for bromine, and back to the start for diiodine, right? What does that tell you, that as you go down the rows of the periodic table, you don't get some monotonic, up or down in the bond strength, but it goes up and down. What do you infer from that kind of thing when you get curves? Yeah. Uh, there must be at least two factors involved in this, okay? And those factors are probably the overlap of the sigma bond, which is best for fluorine-fluorine, but the interaction of unshared pairs, which is worse for fluorine, okay? So you have two things going on. Okay, anyhow, we can add those two together to see what it's going to cost us to break those two bonds. Uh, and there are the values. They're in the range of 150 kilocalories per mole. But then when we do the reaction, we're going to profit by making the bonds on the right. So that we have various values for the carbon X bond that we got out of that table we just showed. And for the HX bond, and there's the return we get. Okay. Now, is this, are these going to be favorable reactions? Well, in the case of uh, fluorine, it's wildly favorable. It's favorable by 109 kilocalories per mole, right? 
but uh, it's only 19 kilocalories per mole for chlorine, only nine for bromine, and it's 12 kilocalories uphill in the case of iodine. So you're not gonna make a profit if you try to set up a factory to convert methane and iodine to methyl iodide and HI. In fact, you'd wanna run it the opposite direction, right? Okay, but the others at least overall are favorable. So we know from equilibrium now that for three of the halogens, this reaction should be favorable, and for one of them, it should be unfavorable, right? So, but how about the rate? How fast will it be, okay? Now, if this were the mechanism, first you break two bonds, then you change partners and reattach, the activation energy for getting up to the transition state for this, where both bonds are broken, is going to be this cost, right? So is break two bonds, then make two a plausible mechanism? Could we get a rate that's reasonable on the basis of that? Well, how do you go about, if you know the activation energy you have to get to, how do you go about calculating the rate? Debbie? Right, it's 10 to the 13th per second times 10 to the... 10 to the minus three-fourths of that energy. Okay, so let's think about it then in this case. Suppose we take uh, one of these that's about 140, right? So at room temperature, 300 Kelvin, which is where your approximation works, the three-fourths, right? We find that it's 10 to the 13th per second times 10 to the minus 106, three-fourths of one of these numbers, right? So it'll be 10 to the minus 93 per second, right? That's a very unfavorable number. So forget that, there's no way a mechanism like that could work under, at room temperature. What might you be able to do to, to realize such a reaction? In, yeah, Amy? Higher temperature. So I suppose you go to 3,000 Kelvin instead of 300 Kelvin. Now instead of 3 fourths, it's 3 fortieths. Okay, so if we go to 3,000 Kelvin, then it's 10 to the 13th times 10 to the minus 10.6 which would be 250 times a second, right? So that's, that would be accessible, except that there probably is something else that could happen when you're at that very high temperature, okay? So, so that this, fundamentally, this is not a reasonable mechanism. And we already know a better way to go about it from looking at these uh, potential energy surfaces for uh, transferring an atom between two other atoms. Okay, remember we start with H plus H2, and then it, we can move around on this surface and have for collinear three H's, we can get the energy for different uh, uh, differences between two of the H's and the other two H's, right? So there's the product we wanna go to where a hydrogen has been transferred from the right to the left. And one way to do it, the way we've been talking about is to go by way of three separate atoms, right? Which means we go up there, way up in energy, very slow, and once we get there, then zing, we go down, okay? But it's very hard to get up to this plateau, okay? On the other hand, as we know from the marble, the way it actually works is to transfer a hydrogen between two rather than to break a bond first and then make a bond. So make it as you break it that way, and that's gonna be much faster. So this kind of displacement reaction is the way we want to do it, to make a new bond as we break the old one. Okay, that's how we're going to do it, and we already talked about this last semester. First, you take chlorine and you break its bond. That's going to require some energy, okay? But once you have the free radical, then you can transfer a hydrogen atom, making a bond as you break a bond, so going through that pass rather than over the big plateau. And now the product of that is HCl, one of the products you want. But the other one is another free radical made without having to spontaneously break a bond. And now it can react with Cl2 to give the other product we want in the chlorine atom. And we then have, can go back to the beginning in this free radical chain. And this is what we talked about last semester. Okay, another way of writing the same thing is to say we can have the starting materials here at the top left and bottom right, the halogen and the... Uh, and the alkane, and first, and then we can have an X atom that we got somehow. It could be by heat, breaking a relatively weak bond. It could be by light. 
It could be by some chemical reaction that generates a free radical, but somehow we get a radical. Then it can react in a hydrogen atom transfer to give one of the products, the green XH here, and another radical. And it can react with the halogen to give the other product and go back where you started. So what we have is a cyclic machine that just cranks round and round, right? So one, and it, it preserves the radicalness of the situation. You don't have to break any new bonds spontaneously, only to get the first radical. Now we're going to talk about this some more also later on. Uh, but but uh, to look now at how we're going to rearrange things, if you want to have a mechanism for a re reasonable rate, what you're going to do is trade two of these columns, right? Instead of breaking two and then making two, we'll trade those two columns so that on the left we make and break, on the right in step two we make and break, right? So now when we look at how much each of these takes, step one now in the case of fluorine is actually favorable, right? Step two is wildly favorable in the case of fluorine and overall it's very favorable as we knew. But now you can see that these others, uh, although overall favorable, one of the steps is unfavorable, but not drastically unfavorable, only uh, uh, two or 10 or 20 kilocalories per mole. That kind of barrier you can get over. You can't get over the barriers of 50 kilocalories or more. But so now you have two steps, each of them a very simple make as you break atom transfer, right? And of course, here the first one is so high that you're not going to be able to get over it. And even if you could, you wouldn't give the product, it would run, the reaction would run backwards. <coughs> okay. So how can we, so we know the energies of the, of the starting material and products for each of these steps, but we don't really know the activation energy, how much you have to come up before you come down, right? And that's what we're going to be starting to look at next lecture, right? Is how, how can we predict the activation energy for a simple one-step reaction if we know how exothermic or endothermic it is? But even if we could predict the rate of step one or step two, there's still a problem because this, the overall process is not just one step, it's two steps. And how would we know the overall rate if there are two reaction steps going on? This is a little more complicated. So we're going to take a little uh, digression now to learn to cope with complex reactions that involve several steps. Okay? So this is a digression on reaction order and complex reaction. Now, the reaction order is the kinetic, the rate analog of the law of mass action that we talked about at the end last time. Remember, it was just statistical. How likely is it that there are going to be two things next to one another, right? The same thing, the getting next to one another is the same problem if they, things are going to react with one another in getting to the transition state as well. So there's going to be a dependence of rate on concentration the same way that equilibrium depends on concentrations, as we saw last semester. And moreover, this dependence of the rate on concentration can give us information about what kind of mechanism the reaction might be undergoing. So that's why we're particularly interested in it. Now, just to look at some simple ideas first, uh, the rate is how much per second, say, or per minute or hour or day or whatever, how much per second. Okay. So we could have a faucet, we turn it on, and the water comes out a certain rate per second. <clears throat> now, what would happen if you had two faucets? Well, if things were simple, the rate would double. <clears throat> you know if you think carefully about it, it won't quite be that, because there might be a restriction in how much water can get to the two faucets. But in a simple point of view, you double the number of faucets, you double the rate. Okay. There's another way of doubling the rate which is to use a bigger faucet, one that's twice as big, twice the cross-sectional area, okay? Now, in chemistry, we can do the, we can look at how many moles or molecules we get per second, right? And if we have one uh, beaker and then have another beaker or a single beaker with twice the volume, we double the rate, okay? So that will double the rate, but chemists are clever. They can not only change the volume, they can also change the concentration in the same volume. 
And that's the question we have. Obviously, you'd expect it to get faster if you have more stuff, but how much faster? Okay, will it double? So this has to do with what are called rate laws. What that exponent is going to be that says if you, cha if you double the rate, if you double the concentration of a reagent, how much will the rate change, the number of molecules you get per second? Okay, so the rate is the, the increase in product with time. And it's, then there's a rate law, that's some constant, times the concentration of something, right? And maybe several concentrations, but that question mark is the exponent. What power do we, ra do we raise it to? That's what we mean in talking about the kinetic order. If it's to the zeroth power, it's a zeroth order, the first power, first order, second power, second order, and so on. Okay? But those, those exponents will have to do with what the mechanism of the reaction is. And so the only way to discover it is by experiment. So let's first look at some simple one-step reactions, and then we're going to look at complicated reactions. Okay? So in a simple one-step reaction, you could have zero order. This sounds weird, doesn't it? That the rate doesn't depend on how much material you have. You double the amount of material, double the concentration of material, and it doesn't change the rate. All right? Now, how can that be? Well, here's a picture that helps illustrate it for a sheep getting from one field to the other. Now, in this situation, if, he, if the shepherd had more sheep, would the rate increase? Would you get sheep from one field to the other faster? No, they're going as fast as they can, no matter how many sheep are lined up. Okay? Because it's saturated, it can't go any faster because of how wide he's opening the gate. Okay? So there are real cases like this in chemistry, where you have a catalyst that's, that's involved in converting the starting material to the product. When the catalyst is working as fast as it possibly can, you, increasing the starting material isn't going to increase the rate of the reaction anymore. The, the, uh, the gate can't open any wider, right? And that's often the case with enzymes, okay? So you have the substrate, uh, the starting material, which reacts, which interacts with the catalyst in order to go to product. But if the catalyst is rate limiting, if it's saturated, you can't go any faster. So the rate then is proportional to how much catalyst you have, of course. If you doubled the amount of catalyst under those situations, you'd, you'd double the rate. But the substrate is raised to the zero power. It doesn't make any difference. Okay? So, so the rate is actually just proportional to the catalyst, independent of the, of the substrate. Right? But if the catalyst was, if, if, the, if doing the experiment, you didn't realize that there was a catalyst in there doing it, you just thought it was happening spontaneously, then you'd say it's zero order. Right? So that's a zero order reaction, zero order kinetics. Okay? Uh, but that works only when the sheep are really crowded here. If the sheep were all over the fields and some coming through, if the concentration were lower, then uh, having more sheep would allow them to get through faster. You're not saturating the catalyst. So if the, it's, but it becomes first order in substrate when you have very low concentration of substrate, but at some higher concentration, it becomes zero order. So it's always, in principle, possible to lower the concentration until it becomes first order. But in fact, under many conditions, it would be zero order. Okay, so that's an example of zero order. Uh, now, first order says the rate is proportional to the first power of the amount of reagent you're using. And that's, of course, very reasonable. It's like the water coming through the taps or something like that. Okay, now, if you have first order kinetics, the, the amount of product you get in time looks like this. It's an exponential approach to the, to the 100%, right? Or this particular one is drawn with a certain rate constant. If the rate constant were faster, it would rise more quickly. If the rate constant were lower, it would rise more slowly, but always it would go in this case to 100%, okay? You could, instead of monitoring the product, you could look at the disappearance of starting material, which is then an exponential decay, just the same thing upside down. Now, so exponential decay means you have a constant, 
so-called half-life. Now, I chose 0.69 here for a reason. It's because the half-life, the time it takes for half the material to go away, is 0.69 divided by whatever k is. So if I chose uh, k to be 0.69, the half-life is 1. Okay? So after one minute, one second, pardon me, the half, of the, the, half the material remains. After another one second, a quarter, then an eighth, then a sixteenth, and so on, right? And that's, that's the necessary, you can prove it easily by mathematics, with a, for, for a first order reaction. There is a repeating half-life, okay? Now, suppose you have a more complex situation where the, it's first order kinetics, but it's reversible. So the starting material at a certain rate constant goes to product, but the product can also come back to starting material, suppose at a much lower rate, okay? So at e once you reach equilibrium, the two rates balance, so things cease changing, right? In fact, you know, in the 19th century, equilibrium, uh, rate, e equilibrium situations were initially discussed not as equilibria, but as balanced rates, right? Uh, so at any rate, they're the same thing. So uh, whatever K1 is times the concentration of starting material will be equal to whatever what K minus 1 is times the concentration of product. Okay? Or we could take the divide through by starting material here and K1 over here. So, uh, so K1 over K minus 1 is the equilibrium constant. <coughs> So now you approach, the, the product doesn't go to 100% nor the starting material to zero, right? But if you start with all starting material, they, you get these exponential behaviors and it's still exponential. That's what's interesting, right? But it doesn't approach zero, right? So here after one second, where with that rate constant you would have fallen by half, you don't fall quite to half, right? Because some stuff is coming back. But if you go to, to the ultimate goal of equilibrium here, then you find, notice the equilibrium constant is three. I chose that to be a third of that. So there's, uh, uh, so there's one quarter of the, of the red material and three quarters of the blue material at equilibrium. So, but if we draw this at 25%, the, the value that the starting material actually approaches asymptotically, exponentially, we find now there is a, ha a repeating half-life, right? This is truly an exponential. But the interesting thing is that it's an exponential decay to the equilibrium mixture, but the half-life is, ha is 0.69 divided by the sum of the two rate constants. Again, this is easy to demonstrate using calculus, but it's just sort of cute that you add forward and reverse rate constants together to get how rapidly it approaches equilibrium. Okay? So there's a there are first order reactions, both just one way and reversible. Now, second order reactions proportional to the square of A. That's obviously true if two A's have to get together in order to, to, to uh, to uh, reach the transition state. But it could also be second order if you have an A interacting with a B. In that case, you say it's first order in A and first order in B and second order overall, okay? <clears throat> but what if B is effectively constant? So as time goes on, A is decreasing, but B is not decreasing. How could that possibly be the case? How could you have a reaction where B doesn't decrease? Well, B is a catalyst. Ah, if B were a catalyst, it doesn't get consumed. That's one way. Another way is that the, that the B is in gross excess compared to A. So even though A consumes a B, it doesn't change its concentration appreciably because the concentration is so large compared to that of A. So if B is much greater than A, you get that. And in that situation, you say that you can neglect B by incorporating it into the K, right? Whatever B is, it's not changing. 
for all you know when you're doing the experiment. You might not even know there's a catalyst there, but it's there in always the same amount. You always get the same rate constant. And in a situation like that, you say it's pseudo first order. It behaves as if it's first order, even though it really depends on something else as well. And so you can have a second order process could be a pseudo first order rate con uh, constant. For example, suppose B were the solvent, right? Then it appears that it's a first order reaction, even though it turned out that the solvent had to react with the thing in order to do it. Okay? So that's pseudo first order. Now, if you have a second order reaction compared to a first order reaction, that is a, a regular second order reaction where two molecules of A have to get together, what you find is that a first order reaction goes like this, but second order starts faster and ends slower. So it's no longer exponential. Obviously it's decreasing, but not with a half-life, not exponentially, not a repeating half-life, because it gets slower as it goes along, because it depends on the square of the concentration. So it slows faster, it's not exponential, there is no constant half-life. So that's how you would know that something is second order. You measure how much in the first increment of time, the second increment, and they're not exponential. And now we'll get on to complex reactions and the idea of the rate limiting step. So suppose that you go to an intermediate and then it goes to product, but suppose the transition state energies are like this, right? So it's very slow to get to the intermediate, but once you're at the intermediate, it rapidly goes to product, right? Now, this reactive intermediate never builds up. You never have an appreciable amount of it because even if it were equilibrium with this, there's very little of it with a big energy difference here. So you might not even know that that intermediate is there, right? You get there and it immediately goes to product. In that case, uh, the, the, who cares really about what rate this is as long as it's fast? The rate at which you get product is the rate at which you get this. It never builds up. Every time you get it, it goes immediately to product or very quickly. So this first step then, even though it's a two-step reaction, the first step is the one whose rate makes a difference. If you double the rate of the first step, then you'll double the overall rate of the reaction, right? Because the second step doesn't make any difference. So that's called the rate limiting step, right? On the other hand, suppose that that first reaction is fast and the second one is slow, right? So you have a rapid pre-equilibrium formed between these two. Again, not very much of the intermediate, but they, it reaches an equilibrium concentration compared to this, or almost. And then slowly it goes to product. Now, two things that are in equilibrium with the same thing are in equilibrium with each other. So to the extent that that intermediate is in equilibrium with the starting material, and we treat the rate of going over here, as an equilibrium between the intermediate and this transition state, we could also pretend that the, that the transition state is in equilibrium with the starting material, since they're both in equilibrium with the intermediate, right? So now who cares that there's an intermediate, that there's a first step? We can calculate the rate just on the basis of getting how much of this transition state there is by assuming it's in equilibrium with that starting material. Okay, so now the second step, or the, the tra second transition state is rate limiting. All we have to know is how high it is compared to the starting material. We don't care about the intermediate. So you can have one step or the other step be rate limiting, right? Or if they're not drastically different, both of them could affect the rate, right? Many cases, one or the other is, a, is rate limiting. But if you want to see how it works out in a, in a complicated case, we have a starting material that can go reversibly to the intermediate, and then the intermediate goes to product, all with certain rate constants. Uh, there's a, on the website, you can get an Excel program, which is a crummy Excel program. I'm sorry, it executes very slowly. Uh, you can change the parameters to make it go a little faster. But you can put in what energy you want for the starting material, the intermediate, and the product, and what energy you want for the transition state, one and two and see how the overall rate compares with what you would have calculated if it had been just the first step that you had to get over or just the second step that you had to get over. In this particular case where each of these is about something between a kilocalorie and a kilocalorie and a half, the difference between those two, 
and the difference between these two, uh, you get this. Okay, so this is the actual uh, rate. Notice the amount of starting material immediately falls quickly. That's when you're establishing equilibrium between these two. So starting material is going to intermediate. And then slowly it goes away as the starting material, as the intermediate goes to product. Here's the intermediate. It immediately builds up to some concentration and then it changes very slowly. It stays fairly stable for any short period of time. Okay. Uh, now, uh, if, you, if, this, if you didn't have the first barrier and had only the second one, it was a one-step reaction, this is what you would have calculated for those same energies. So not too bad. So in fact, the second, state, the second transition state is pretty much rate limiting. You get pretty much the same result, right? On the other hand, if, you didn't, if transition state two weren't there and you only had to get over transition state one, then you'd have that blue one there if it were the sole barrier, right? So very far from that. But you don't make a, even in this situation, you don't make a very big mistake if you just ignored the intermediate and the transition step and the first transition state and said it was only transition state two. It's rate limiting, right? And if you, if you fiddle with this, you'll find that, that if you start changing these differences very much, then one of them or the other one becomes clearly rate limiting. You get much better agreement, okay? Now, I said that this was between a kilocalorie and a kilocalorie and a half. Three-fourths of that is about one. So the, ratio, the equilibrium ratio is about 10. Or actually, I said nine here. Nine times as much starting material as intermediate. So once the intermediate reaches its steady sort of equilibrium uh, relationship with the starting material, after this very quick rise here, once you get there, then there's nine times as much starting material as there is in intermediate. That's nine times as much as this, okay? And that persists then, that ratio. It's, when you get to here, it's nine times as much of one or the other and so on, okay? Now, this, this is also a factor of 10 between this. What that's, that's, this has to do with rates, remember. So this is how fast the intermediate goes back to starting material is 10 times faster than how fast it goes to product because of those differences in the, in the delta H of activation, right? And what that means is that once the intermediate reaches its steady state, its equilibrium relationship with the starting material, it, re it re yields product one-tenth as fast as it has formed. So it's, it forms very rapidly, you can see that here, right? But now individual molecules are still being formed just as rapidly or almost as rapidly, but they're going away just as rapidly as they're formed, right? Everyone that's formed at a certain rate goes back to starting material 10 times for every time it goes to product, or uh, nine times for every time it goes to product, right? So a 10th of the time it goes on to product. So now the rate of going from starting material to product is however fast it goes over the first one times one-tenth because it's not changing. The, the, it's reached a so-called steady state. This, it's changing very slowly. Individual molecules are going very rapidly. But it's, so the, the rate of an individual molecule to go from starting material to product is how fast it goes to intermediate times a tenth. Okay. So that's uh, sequential reactions, the idea of the rate limiting step. Now, an, a really interesting concept is fractional order, but I see that we've reached the time now, so we'll have to wait for fractional order to the next lecture.